السلام علیکم گائز ڈاکٹر ذاکر نائک نے پاکستان کے لیڈروں کے بارے میں کیا کہا آئیے ہم ان کی زبانی سنتے ہیں دا نیکسٹ کوشچن از فرام علیزا فاطمہ شی اسٹڈنگ ایم بی بی ایس فرام پاکستان وین اے کرپٹ لیڈر از الیکٹیڈ وی آر آلسو وی آر آلسو ریسپانسبل فار دا سنز ہی کمٹس ایز اے لیڈر واٹ شوڈ بی آ پرائرٹیز وائل الیکٹنگ اے لیڈر In today's circumstances, when we cannot find a loyal and honest leader, what should we do? Should we give our vote or waste our right to elect? A similar question is posed by Majid Khan from Hyderabad, India. What are the qualities which we should look for in today's age for selecting a leader for the Muslims? According to me, Dr. Zakir Naik would be my best choice to lead the Muslim Ummah today. Basically, the question posed here is that in today's world, most of the Muslim leaders are dishonest, they are corrupt. So who should we choose? Or should we let our vote go in waste? And the second question is that what are the qualities that a Muslim leader should have? And the brother suggested that I should be the leader, which will come to it later on, which I'll answer, inshallah. As far as what should the qualities of a Muslim leader be, is the best exemplary Muslim leader in the world is a beloved Prophet Muhammad That is the reason Michael H. Hart, he places him number one in the list of 100 most influential human beings in the history of humankind. Imagine he being a non-Muslim places Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as number one and he says that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was not only successful as a religious leader, he was even successful as a social and a political leader. Because of that he placed him number one. That he was not only a successful religious leader, he was also a successful social and a political leader. So the best example of a political leader in the world today we have is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. After that, we have the example of the Khulfa Rashidin, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali. They are best examples for us after the Prophet. And that's the reason Michael H. Hart, he places you know, Umar al-Khattab radiallahu an, may Allah be with him, as number 51. Because he was a very successful leader. So if today, I'm unfortunately, I don't know of any Muslim leader who is anywhere close to the quality of leadership of Prophet Muhammad Not even 0.001%. Leave us that, not even close to Hazrat Umar an. Umar bin Khattab, mashallah, he was, he was, so successful that he expanded uh, the, the rule of the Muslim empire, mashallah. And if you read his seerah, you will find the example how a Muslim leader should be. Unfortunately, unfortunately today, none of the Muslim leaders, we have about 40, we have about 56 to 57 countries in which majority of the people are Muslims in some country 100%. Some more than 95, some more than 90, some more than 50 percent. There are about 57 countries in the world out of a little bit more than 200 countries. That means more than 27 percent of the countries in the world. They, they are countries in which Muslims are in majority. Unfortunately, none of these leaders are anywhere close to Umar al-Khattab radiallahu No way close. And if you read the seerah, of Hazrat Umar, may please with him. He told his family that if any of my family members break any of the rules, they will get double punishment because the family of a caliph should be following the rules much more than others. If they break any rule, they will get double punishment. And you have several examples. Unfortunately, we find today that most of the Muslim leaders, they are more, as, as the sister rightly asked the question, that most of them are corrupt, most of them are dishonest, they are involved more in making money for themselves, unfortunately. Just let me give you an example of Hazrat Umar that 
when he was the Khalifa, you know, he had uh, uh, two of his sons, Abdullah and Ubaidullah. May Allah be pleased with them both. When they went to the governor of Basra, when they were passing Basra, the governor called them and he was very happy to meet them. He said, what can I do for you? Then he said, why don't you give this amana to Amirul Mu'mini, to your father, the Umar al-Khattab is the other one. But I give you permission that on your way you can utilize the money for business and when you get the principal amount back, keep the profit and you can give the principal amount back to Amirul Mu'mini. So both the sons of uh, Umar al they take the money and on the way they do business and they get a huge profit and they go and give the principal amount to their father Amirul Mu'mini and they say this is what the governor of Basra said and this is the amana. So Hazrat Umar was angry and he asked his sons that did the governor give this money to somebody else? They said no. So how come, they, how come he has given it to you? So Umar al commanded to his sons that give the principal amount as well as the complete profit. Give everything to Baitul Mal. Then the people who were close to Hazrat Umar the other Sahabas, they told that this is a business deal and the permission was given by the governor. So what is their fault? And if it's a business deal, we're allowed to do that. So finally, after a lot of discussion, when they said that, you know, he should change his ruling, then Hazrat Umar said, okay, fine. Give 50% of the profit to the Baitul Mal. So we see he was so strict and he made it a law that any of his governor, before they appointed, he checks their wealth. And once they relieve the post, he checks their wealth again. And he allows only a small percentage of increase. Anything more than that, he said, give it to Baitul Mal. Not that he accused them of corruption. No. He said that means even if you spend more time in the worldly affairs, you're not fit to be a governor. If you want to be a governor under my rule, you have to give your pure time to your duty. Even if you make money, honestly, that is not your purpose. Unfortunately, we see today in the Muslim Ummah, most of the Muslim leaders, they are far away from the deen. If you just take the basic concept of Salah, I believe more than 50% of the Muslim leaders, they may not be offering five times salah in congregation. There may be a handful, just a small percentage who may be offering five times salah that are also in the congregation. So unfortunately, the state of the Muslim Ummah today, we have gone far away from the Quran and Sunnah. That's the reason we have today that the situation that the Ummah is in today because we have gone far away from the Quran and the Sunnah. We have gone far away from the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teachings of beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And I do agree with the sister that today unfortunately the choice that we have is so limited and unfortunately most of them would not fit the criteria of how a Muslim leader should be as per the Quran and Sunnah. So what should we do in this situation? What we have to do is that we have to select the best of the worst. And if we analyze, as I mentioned, that almost all the leaders, they don't have the qualities that a true Muslim leader should have, like Hazrat Umar or even a small percentage, not even 2% of the quality of Hazrat Umar so what we have to do, we have to select the best of the worst. And I do agree with the sister that almost all of the Muslim politicians, they are corrupt, whether it be financially, whether it be with Iman, they are almost all. There may be one or two or three exceptions to the rule. So what should we do in this situation? As I mentioned, we should select the best of the worst. Number one, according to me, is that select that Muslim leader who is becoming a leader on the Islamic card. That he's proud to be a Muslim and he says that I will, I'm proud to be a Muslim and I will upheld the Islamic law. Whether he does or not is secondary. Because in today's world, the basic rule for a politician today, unfortunately, is that he has to maintain his chair. By hook or by crook. It may go against his set of rules, it may go against his deen, it may be go against his family. As long as he is sitting on the chair, he is happy. So he will do anything to maintain 
his chair. Because of this reason, my first advice is that if two, two Muslim leaders are standing, select that Muslim leader who openly says that he is proud to be a Muslim and he is coming on the Islamic card. He may or may not be a practicing Muslim that is secondary. I will go to the extent of saying that if there is one Muslim leader who is practicing Islam 20% but is coming on the secular card, he is not saying that I will protect the Muslims, I will follow Islam and there is another Muslim leader who is following 10% of Islam but he is coming with the Islamic card. He is openly saying that I will, I will protect the religion of Islam, I will, I will protect the Muslims. Better select the person who is following 10% Islam as coming with the Islamic card rather than the other Muslim leader who is following 20% and is not coming on the Islamic card because the person who is not coming on the Islamic card will not go out of his way to follow the Islamic principles because that is not that was not his trump card to win the election. Whereas the other Muslim leader who may not be following Islam as much as the other person, both are below average. But at least because he's come with the Islamic card, he will see to it that he will make more, he'll make more masajid. He may not pray Salah, but he'll see to it he will make more masajid, more mosque. He will protect the law of Islam. He will help the Muslim because his trump card to win the election was the Islamic card. This is a very key point. Unfortunately, and we know, as the sister rightly said, that majority, almost all are corrupt. So, but if you have a corrupt leader who's coming with the Islamic card, is better than a corrupt leader who's coming without the Islamic card. There are maybe one, two or three, if we search in the Muslim Ummah, who may be following majority of the Farais in Islam. But they may not be having the acumen to be a good leader. We have on the other example some Muslim leader who I have praised in my speech. They may be bold, they may stand for justice, they may not be following Islam to the T. They may not be offering five times salah, may be offering maybe a few times in a week. But they may openly protect the Islamic cause because that is their principle, but they are not doing it for the Islamic cause, they are doing it because that is what they feel is right. They are more for the cause of humanity. But Islam is far above humanity. So because of that, they may be, they, they may bring a voice in the international media, but their practice may not be Islamic. So such leaders may benefit in one particular aspect of Islam to the Muslim Ummah. But on the other hand, they may be a danger. So that is the reason I personally prefer that you select those Muslim leaders who number one are proud to be Muslims. Unfortunately, when you look at the Muslim leaders, most of them they are not following the Sunnah. I am giving a small example of keeping a beard. It is not a big thing. To keep a beard doesn't take any effort. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, as mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, in volume number 7, Hadith number 5892, the Prophet said, that do the opposite of what the mushriks do, what the unbelievers do. Grow your beard and trim your mustaches. According to all four schools of thought, all the four ahimmas, keeping a beard is fard. It's such a small effort. But yet, unfortunately, majority, more than 75% of the Muslim leaders who are men, they don't have a beard. Why? That means they're not proud to be Muslims. This is that doesn't mean if you keep a beard, you have fulfilled all the requirements. No, please don't get me wrong. In requirements, you have to follow the 70 major sins and see how good the person is. So what we have to realize, my basic point here is that select those Muslim leaders who are proud to be Muslims, even though they may be less in practice. A person who is proud to be a Muslim and a practicing Muslim is the best, who is practicing and keeping, doing all the farais. I don't think so. If you search, you may find one or two, but on the face of it, I cannot. They may not be good leaders, but they may be following the Farais. So here, see to it that you like those who are coming with the Islamic card and those who are proud to be Muslims and present themselves as Muslims are not shy when they meet the non-Muslim leaders. They are not shy to present themselves as Muslims. 
Now coming to the, uh, to the second part of the question, that these criteria, the best is read the seerah of the Prophet and seerah of Hazrat Umar Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali, and you see the examples in their life, how, how honest. And none of these leaders, they wanted to become leaders. The hadith of the Prophet, anyone who wants to be an Amir, wants to be a leader, is not the right person. Here we find that most of the leaders want to be leaders. In the Islamic teachings, a person who himself wants to be a leader should not be made the leader. The other people who make him, and all the Khalifas, they were made by others. And you have these examples. As far as the question posed by the brother Majid, that he feels that Dr. Zakir Naik is the best choice, I'm sorry, I disagree with you totally. I don't have the qualities to be a leader at all. And I don't consider myself. And what I've seen in my life, in my personal life, I've seen that many religious people, when they enter into politics, almost all of them went away from their deen. I know several scores of Muslims who are very good practicing Muslims, who are offering five times Salah, who are very honest, and they give such beautiful lectures. But the moment they entered politics, they got corrupt, they got influenced. Because unfortunately, the Ummah that we have today, they are not like the Sahabas at the time of the Prophet Nikhul Farashadeen. Our Nikhul Farashadeen, first they would take decision thinking, what would Allah want me to do? They were more scared of disappointing Allah. Today, our politicians are more interested in how it will benefit them personally. They don't, they don't want to disappoint the vote bank. The Khulfa Rashidin, they did not want to disappoint Allah. They would take a decision which would be completely against them, as long as it pleases Allah. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 135, that, Ya amunu, O you believe, stand out for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your kitakin, against the rich or poor. Allah protects all. So, such type of quality, you know, so I, there were many times the question was asked to me in India that why don't I enter politics and I said that, I mean, why do you want to become an enemy? I mean, I have to jokingly tell them. Because in today's world, if you enter politics, there are high chances that you will spoil your akhirah. Very high chances. Because the way the ummah and the society is made, that if you want to live and remain in that seat, you will have to compromise on your principles. And the best example I can give you is of Dr. Isra Ahmed. Dr. Isra Ahmed, you know that, mashallah, he was a very great guy, and he gave tafsir of the Quran, he was very knowledgeable, he was popular, and he stood for election, and he won the election. After he won the election, he got a uh, member of parliament he was made, and he was given some post, and after a few months he resigned. He said, they're asking me, how, what should be the width of the road? That's not what I'm made for. When I'm giving them Islamic solution, they don't want to listen. He immediately resigned. So a good person who is following the deen, he will either have to give up his deen or give up his position. And whatever Dr. Isra Ahmed did was the best. There may be few people like Dr. Isra Ahmed who may be Islamic and may have got into politics, but I don't know anyone who is a leader. May have come on a lower position, not as the head of state, and may be following the deen. But the way the society is made today, our ummah, you will either have to give up the post that you are in or give up the deen. So first of all, I'm not fit to be in that position. Neither do I want to spoil my akhirah. I would, I'm very happy in being a dai and I'm very satisfied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever ni'amah has given me. I hope that you will like this video. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to the channel. Until the next video, Allah Hafiz.